Now turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 as we continue our journey through the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1. And the title of this message is The Living and Enduring Word. The Living and Enduring Word. And as we wrap up this first chapter, it's taken us seven weeks just to get through chapter 1 so far. Uh, But we're going to look closely at verses 22 through 25, plus we'll get into the first three verses of chapter uh, 2. And these verses kind of provide a bit of a summary of the chapter, and Paul includes some encouragements, uh, commands, reminders, statements of profound significance uh, for the Christian. So let's read our passage, and then we'll go and unpack each verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious." So as we see here, Peter now directs our attention to the role of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. Uh, He imparts to us a kind of a new pattern of life and principles in life. And so the new pattern of life is uh, as we experience by the way of cleansing. You see, you've been purified in your souls and by way of commitment obeying the truth through the Spirit. So... This is what we call uh, practical sanctification uh, in contrast with positional sanctification. We talked about this when we first started uh, 1 Peter. Um, And so positional sanctification, as a reminder for those who were here or this is the first time you're hearing it, it has to do with your standing before God in Christ. Our standing with God is perfect. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, He secures it for us, and therefore we're fit for heaven, as we'll ever be. Even a newborn babe in Christ is just as fit as those who have been walking with the Lord 30, 50, 100 years, or however long they've been walking with the Lord. It's your position in Christ that makes all the difference. Practical sanctification, by contrast, has to do with your current life right now. Often imperfect, right? No one's perfect. We all stumble, we all fall, we all have our issues, we all yield to temptation. And although we don't lose our salvation, in consequence we lose that peace and joy, often our testimony, and frequently the assurance of our salvation, because the enemy of our souls will try to trip you up. Oh, you lost your salvation because you said a, a cuss word. Or you lusted after someone. You don't lose your salvation because of those. Our practical sanctification has to be brought more in line with the positional sanctification. And as we'll see in our text here, the Word of God reveals to us who we really are. And the Spirit of God quickens our conscience to convict us of sin. This means that the cleansing is available to us, and with the cleansing comes a fresh commitment. After you confess, after you repent, you want to have a a right relationship with the Lord. You want to walk with the Lord, and then, of course, we stumble and fall. It's not that we're trying to, it's just because of our sinful nature until we're in glory. And when we finally get to heaven, we will be perfect, right? Just as it says in 1 John chapter uh, 3. So no doubt, as we've mentioned over and over, Peter's original readers had experienced the struggles of being scattered, being distressed and tested and tempted. They had all the ingredients of lost hope and the fragmented within the community of believers there. And so in the context of this passage, Peter begins what we might call kind of a motivational message. Um, And he's taken the role of a coach or personal training, encouraging them, pull it together. Because this is what happens within the body of Christ. And because they're part of the same family, we need to be moving in the same direction toward the same goal. How is that possible? 
How do we, uh, as believers, support one another? How do we develop unity and community and avoid loneliness and uh, helplessness? Well, again, Peter answers that for us to this question, as we'll see in verse 22. Uh, It requires obedience to the truth. And again, we obey the truth, God's standard, and what it means to be a Christian. We'll also see uh, to uh, purify the soul. So uh, this excludes all the... um, Uh, pride and prejudices, grudges and bitterness. It means getting rid of and cleansing of those things that stand between brothers and sisters in Christ, and we'll unpack that in a little bit more. It requires sincere love. Because of our obedience to the truth, the cleansing of our souls, we are free to love without hypocrisy. Uh, We're given this extra measure of grace to overlook the faults of others. So with all that in mind, let's dive into our text to take a deeper look. Verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So as you see here, Peter is continuing on his call to holiness as we talked about in verse 15 and 16. And though believers ought to be holy because that's who God is. We're to pattern our lives after him. Uh, And... uh, And so, as we mentioned in last week's message, people cannot be holy on their own. You know, uh, you need the Word of God. You need the Holy Spirit in your life. He's the one that produces that in us as we obey the Word. And again, we're always going to struggle between the new nature and the old nature because of our flesh. And this is what Peter talk, or Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, if you're taking note. You see, the battle of the flesh. Uh, is, is this constant war that we're having down here. But with the Spirit's help, believers can grow towards holiness because their souls have been purified by their obedience and love. So obedience to God's Word produces purity. Obedience to the truth, as we see in this verse, uh, could refer to the, their time of conversion, uh, when they believe the gospel message, or it could be their daily obedience to God's command. Both are important. We need them both. In either case, Peter is pointing out that their conversion had changed their lives. There should be a change in a person's life when they come to Christ. You're going from darkness, now you're into light. You're under the power of Satan, now you're under the power of God. That's a radical difference. There's no neutral ground. Uh, either you're for God or you're against God. Okay, So there has to be a radical change in a person's life when they come to the Lord. So this change is not meant internally uh, only, but it's also to be checked out by their actions and their attitudes and their conduct. And it's impossible, as we mentioned, to live a holy life apart from the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Uh, Just as the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 9, How can a young man, or woman for that matter, cleanse their way by taking heed according to the Word? So how does one get their right their life right with God. Uh, How do they keep it right? Well, it just answered it right there, by taking heed according to the word. And you'll notice that the answer to this question is not just simply the word, but it's taking heed, being obedient to the word. Okay? The word heed there means to mind or to regard with care, to take notice of, to attend, to observe. So to cleanse your way, you must accept the Bible as your final authority and obey it. So it's one thing to, hey, I believe the Bible, but are you obeying it? Are you doing what it tells you to do, period? And so that's what Peter's talking about here in this passage. So these Christians were holy because they had obeyed the truth. And so if we're going to live a holy life that's pleasing to God, we must live according to the Bible as our standard for holy living. Uh, just as it says in James 1.22, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So the bottom line is obedience. If you love me as Jesus says, you'll obey me. That's the simple answer there. Peter continues, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So uh, this verse is talking about loving others. So this is one of the strongest statements, as you'll notice, in the New Testament that talks about brotherly love. Uh, it is uh, virtually, uh, it makes brotherly love the goal of our, uh, our conversion. Uh, it, it, there's nothing more important than love in practical Christianity. Uh, so our love for one another is a result of Christ's love for us. As Jesus says, greater love is none than this than one who lays his life down for his friend in John 15, 13. 
So Jesus put that principle into action, that principle into a picture. So if you want to see true biblical love, you look at Christ. As Jesus said in John 15, 12, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So to love people the way Jesus did means to love them unconditionally. That's tough, isn't it? But that's the goal. That's the standard. So the love for the brethren is proof of our salvation. While hate for others is a good indication that salvation has not taken place in a person's life or they're walking in darkness. That's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 9 through 11. It says this, He who says he's in the light but hates his brother is in darkness until now, and he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. There's a lot of hatred in the body of Christ. They're walking in darkness, according to this verse. So a man or a woman who claims to be a Christian and hates others is a deceived person. So there needs to be a radical change in that person's life or that situation. And only the, the word of the Lord can do that. And the Spirit of God convict a person to do that and get right with the Lord. And so the Apostle John looks at Christians with compassion as a test of their conversion. So our compassion toward others proves our Christianity. Remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 34 and 35, A new commandment that I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this all will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Are we known for our love for one another? That is a key characteristic in the life of a believer. Do we have love for one another? I want to be known for love. I know I have a long way to go, but that's the goal. I want to be known for love. And as you can see for, so far, our love and our care for one another gives the lost world a picture of God's love for them. We are to represent Christ to them, to be salt and to be light. So Peter expects the growth in purity and holiness that would result in a deeper love uh, among Christians. So not merely outward appearance or profession, but genuine mutual love uh, of our Christian brothers and sisters that comes from the heart. It's easy to say, I love you, but are you showing it? Is, it? is it an action as well? Now, in order to do this, we have to let go of evil thoughts and feelings toward brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, notice, as we saw in this passage here, Peter used the word Philadelphia, the love of the brothers, uh, the phrase of sincere love or genuine mutual love, and then he changed the word from love in a, a, a tense form of the word uh, uh, agapeo, which is unconditional. It's a, a stronger, deeper love, uh, where it says love one another fervently, deeply, Eagerly is how it's translated. The word fervently, by the way, is an athletic term, uh, which means to use every muscle, uh, straining. So that's how we're to love one another. This command to love one another, this kind of love indicates unconditional love, which doesn't hesitate to give love to the unlovely and the unresponsive person. You still love them whether they respond to you or not. That's unconditional love. It's the type of love that sacrifices for one another. So despite our differences and our disagreements, which we're all going to have, but it's how we treat one another with love. And we grow in holiness. We learn to love one another deeply because of the Holy Spirit within us. Now, I firmly believe with every fiber in my being that there should be no issue, no difficulty, no conflict that cannot be worked out in the body of Christ. Period. Okay? The reason why many people don't work things out is because of pride and unforgiveness and lack of humility in their life. Bottom line, right there. As believers, we have everything that we need. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit, right? We have love for our brothers. So why can't we work things out? And this is just this fellowship. This is a, a message for the body of Christ in general, not just for you and me. This is something for all of us, whoever calls themselves a Christian or a born-again believer. And so the point Peter is getting at is since God has called us, 
since we obey the truth of God's word, since we have his love in our hearts, the natural output is that we should be ministering to one another. You are saved to serve. Okay, that's how it works. Because you, can't, you, you want to serve. You want to bless others. You want to help others. That's, a, that's, that's how we show the love of Christ. And so the new life that we have in Christ is evident that we've been born again into the family of God. And that brings us into re, uh, relationship with others who are likewise in the family and who are now our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether you like it or not, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to love these family members, whether it's this congregation or another congregation. If they're believers in Christ, they're our brothers. They're our family. Okay? We need to treat each other that way. Of course, you're going to have disagreements in family, but you're still family. Right? You still got to love one another. And so Peter goes on and speaks of the integrity of love as born-again believers. Notice verse 23. He says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, I don't know about you, but I think being born again is so amazing. It's life-changing. Uh, knowing that my sins are forgiven, I've got the hope of heaven, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. The phrase born again, as you know, is not a physical birth. I go, you've got to be physically born in order to be uh, born again. But it's talking about spiritual renewal. It's an expression used to define the moment and the process when you fully accept Jesus Christ by faith. And so it's an experience when the teachings of Jesus becomes real and the born-again acquired personal relationship with God. It's a love relationship with God, not just a relationship with God. So the term, as you know, it came out of John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who was a, uh, a, a Jewish Pharisee, uh, and he didn't understand. And so Jesus says, you must be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. So being born again means to be born from above. So Nicodemus had a real need, just like all of us had a need. And Christ is the only one that fills that need. He needed his heart changed and spiritual transformation. So new birth, being born again, is the act of God by which eternal life is imparted to a person when they believe. So this means that the Holy Spirit now indwells us, empowers us, and we become joint heirs with Christ, as the scripture tells us. By the way, we rank higher than the angels. Isn't that cool? As, as powerful as angels are, you're, you're, you have a relationship with God. And all the principalities and powers, thrones, dominions, and the inhabitant world to see, you're above that. Because you're a son and daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that means it, it, we're also going to get a new body, glorified body. So in regeneration, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to speak to our spirit and our conscience and brings about a condition that we call the conviction of sin. How many of you have been convicted of sin? Every hand will probably go up. I know it's hot, so it's hard to get it up. Just kidding. <laughs> but this is how it happens. The, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God. It opens the sinner's eyes to Christ and their heart in the realization of their sin. And they need to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Regeneration takes place when the awakened sinner responds to Christ. And so the Holy Spirit begins the cleansing power by the blood of Jesus Christ upon the sinner. And so the Holy Spirit once again inhabits the human spirit and the miracle of regeneration takes place. And thereafter, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God and the life of the born-again believer to affect our spiritual growth. So it's not just when you come to Christ, now you've got to grow up. And so Peter mentions the true, true nature of the Word of God, uh, we believe, for it is the Word of God that the Spirit of God uses to make us children of God. And this word is incorruptible. Notice that. This is the third time, by the way, in this chapter that the word incorruptible is used. The first time we saw it in verse 3 and 4, talking about eternal inheritance is incorruptible. Uh, secondly, we saw it in a previous passage in verse 18 and 19, how God redeemed us with the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ. And then here in verse 23, we have the incorruptible word. Incorruptible, for those who need a dictionary definition, means not to corrupt or to decay. Uh, it speaks of that which will never die. Hallelujah. So our new birth is not uh, by perishable seed, meaning by human origin, uh, which may wither and die, but rather our new birth originated from imperishable seed, the Word of God, described the living and the enduring Word of God. So perishable and imperishable are, are two key phrases in this verse. 
So our lives and earthly pursuit, again, are temporary. We're just passing through. And briefly, as we'll see in verse uh, 24, and then the, only the, the word is eternal, as we'll see in verse 25. So God's word lives and endures forever because it is God who gave it. He lives and endures from eternity past to eternity future. And so the power, the living word of God himself, recorded in scriptures, bringing new life to believers, the enduring word of God himself assures the permanent new life in Christ. Now we also mention, talking about the living word, you're reminded of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, where it talks about the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the divisions of the soul and spirit, and, and the, the joints and the marrows and the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it discerns all that. So it is powerful, the Word of God. It changes a person's life. And again, the Word of God is not going to return void, but it will accomplish what He pleases. So what you're hearing today is what God wants you to hear, whether I'm speaking it or maybe there's a verse that God's going to speak to you individually that comes to mind, but you need to hear the Word of God. It's only through the hearing and the reading of the Word of God that people can find eternal life. And for those, Scripture tells us the gospel message to make a way of salvation clear to those who seek it. So, as we said, and we talked about how temporary things are in this life, verse 24 and 25 says, Because all flesh as grass, and all the glory of man of the flower of the grass, the grass withers, the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. But now that this is the word which the gospel was preached to you. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 through 8. So Peter is stating, like Isaiah, that all the things in this world are temporary, right? It's all going to burn up. It's all going to fade away. And so people live and die like the grass, like the flower, in comparison to eternity. And so that's Peter's point here. God goes on forever. God's word will stand the test of time. As he says in the gospels, not one jot or tittle will, will by means pass away. Yeah, heaven will pass away, but his word is eternal. It will not pass away. So Peter's big picture is how you to have uh, how to have hope uh, in rough times and difficult times and having joy. And uh, so Peter's ending this chapter with the idea that no matter what you're going through, in comparison to eternity, the time span right now is nothing. Okay, It's just going to burn up. It's just going to fade away. Uh, it may not stop the pain, but it will give us a perspective of our suffering in comparison to eternity. Okay, We're just passing through. As... as Difficult, as painful as whatever you're going through right now, compared to eternity, it's nothing. Okay, it's but a speck of dust, and so that brings us hope. Uh, that brings us eternal joy, no matter what we're going through. So everything in this life, possessions, accomplishment, people, will eventually fade away and disappear. All flesh, every person, as it says, all human existence. So as the grass, the flowers bloom uh, for a season, they wither and fall. And, and so uh, all this is passing away. The glory refers to the earthly attainments. So only God's word and his will and work are permanent. And so... Uh, so we see it's talking about the eternal word. It's, it's not going to fa fade away. It's not going to fail. So Peter's uh, re readers would face suffering and persecution, but that's only going to be temporary. And as the word of the Lord endures forever, so their salvation and subsequent glory that will endure forever as well. The last phrase there in verse 25. Now this is the word which is preached to you, the gospel that was preached to you. So it's talking about, and again, at the time of Peter writing, they didn't have the whole Bible like we have. They had the Old Testament, and they had bits and pieces of the, of the New Testament. But this is essentially talking about from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. The whole Bible is what we need. The, the gospels preach. God intends that his word to bring us eternal life with him. Uh, he has spoken his word to us. He desires that we have full confidence in him and what he has said to us. And you can have confidence that this is the word of God. Not one person has been able to contradict it or disprove it. It's still standing the test of time. Now, the, uh, the, it seems that the word gospel here has a wider connotation than what the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. But it, it's, it's the whole subject of Christ is what this is also talking about as well. 
Now, Peter continues on because the thought continues in chapter 2 using several analogies of communication of truth and what it means to be a Christian. While chapter 1 was really emphasizing the importance of being born again into the family of God, chapter 2 now stresses the necessity of growing into a mature Christian because that's a result after you've been born again. So Peter's going to describe the the church as a spiritual house, as we'll see a little bit later, and how some things do not belong in the life of a child of God. So we're to separate ourselves from them, and we're to root them out. And so he calls upon us uh, to respond to the uh, the new nature, uh, which is ours by the new birth, laying aside both internal and external sins. So here's where it's going to get heavy. Notice verse 1. Therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking or slander from every kind. Whew, that's a list. So, Peter's asking us to get rid of all these ugly things, essentially. And by saying, therefore, he's just connecting for what was just said in all of chapter 1. And so the point is, we're born again into a new life uh, in Jesus Christ, and therefore opens up with kind of, now what? Now that we're born again, now what? It'd be kind of like, okay, I've committed my life to Jesus, now what do I do now? So the answer to that that question here is here in verse uh, 1. And notice it starts with a new life in Christ, uh, as he begins to work in our internal and external behavior. The first thing that Peter, again, is teaching us before we go out and, and tell people about Jesus and, uh, is that we need to watch our behavior. Okay? So there's a, there's a work that needs to be done in us. Yes, you need to go out and tell people uh, of, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it will just be evident because they'll see a difference in you immediately. They want to know what's going on in your life. Now, does this mean that Peter is asking us to be perfect? Of course not. Like we said, we're all going to struggle. Uh, with sin in this life. The point is, we need to check our behavior. So with that said, again, you go back to this list of bad things, and notice that all the actions listed here are those who do harm to others. So most of the things on this list are not those actions already committed, but it's actions in the mind. This is where it all starts. This is the battle. This is the problem. It's the thoughts. Uh, in, in other words, Peter's saying, kill the bad thoughts before it becomes bad actions. Right? So that's where it starts. So Peter had explained to these believers uh, that the new life in Christ would result in this genuine love uh, so that they would love one another deeply. So we've already talked about that. And, and such love binds believers together as they face the struggles and the persecutions. Believers need to get rid of any attitude or hindrance that would threaten the love for brothers and sisters in Christ. This list certainly threatens that that love for one another. And notice it says, lay aside, or get rid of, uh, is another way of putting it. Put it away, put it off. And you notice that phrase, put away, put off, is used quite a few times throughout the New Testament, uh, indicating the removal of the life of sin, uh, like you're taking off a garment. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter uh, 3 talks about it, Romans chapter 13. Put off these things and put on these things. And, and as you focus on putting on the things of God, you're automatically going to put off those, oh, those things of the flesh. Uh, the Greek tense, by the way, indicates this is a decisive act. This is a decisive act. It needs to be done. It's a command. And so Peter addresses the common, get rid of one's sins uh, only to be born again, Christians. And having a new God-given nature within them, they have the ability to break from this past life of sin. And only a believer can do that. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. A a, a non-believer, someone who's not a Christian, cannot do this. Okay? Now, while we cannot be completely sin-free in this life, no matter how hard we try to put away sin, we are commanded, though, to get rid of sin in order to become more like Christ. So this list of sins that ruins the testimony of believers. And so the sins Peter listed here are fight against the love, as we mentioned, causing dissension among believers. So he had it in his time, in Peter's time, in the early church, and it continues up until today. Same thing happens because there's people. People are sinners. People need the grace of God. 
The first two sins uh, mentioned here refer to uh, the kind of general categories. Uh, the last three sins refer to specific acts and, and that flow out of them. And so that's kind of how you have these two main things, and then these other ones are kind of a, the fruit of it. Uh, to, to give you kind of a, a definition of some of these terms, most of you are, uh, understand what these terms are, but let me get some clarification so we are on the same page of what these sins are and what it looks like. Malice is a driving desire and determination to destroy someone. It's a driving desire and determination to destroy someone. It's an attitude similar to hatred and the desire to inflict pain, harm, or injury on another person. So it includes holding grudges and acting out of those grudges against others. That's malice. The next one is deceit. Uh, Deceit is to act in a misleading way in some action. So it kind of refers to kind of a deliberate dishonesty, uh, speaking uh, or acting with alternative motives. Uh, Anything less than speaking the full truth and honest truth from the heart is deceit. Those little half-truths is still deceit. Uh, The the vice is selfish, two-faced attitude that deceives and hurts others for personal gain. So there's a deceit there to try to get something out of it or to you know, change the outcome of something. Then we see hypocrisy. Uh, This is the yak bar. You're not true to your nature. Everyone is a hypocrite to some degree, right? We say one thing and we do another, right? Um, But it also means it's it's not just that, but it's play acting, uh, presenting uh, good motives that mark kind of a selfish desire. So we we all know what hypocrites look like. Now, envy. Envy is a huge one. Uh, that uh, everyone has to some degree, uh, because we're all jealous of what people have. But envy is wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Okay, So it's an internal attitude that we have, and it will bleed itself into many other things. It means desiring something possessed by someone else. And that could be anything. Clothes, a car, a house, a mate, Uh, ministry, brains, looks, money, whatever God has blessed others with that you want, right? Oh, I wish I could be like that, or I wish I had that, right? So it causes discontentment. It causes resentment as believers make unhealthy comparisons to one another. It also makes them unable to be thankful for the good that comes to others as well. Uh, so when you don't rejoice in uh, the blessings of God upon another, uh, oftentimes it's because of envy and resentment. So the main problem with envy and resentment is that it makes us put our focus on someone else's life instead of our own. Stop looking at other people. They're not your standard. Be your own person. Instead of being grateful for what we have, we become angry for not having what someone else has. And so the worst thing about envy, no matter how smart, how kind, how generous, how beautiful, how accomplished that we may be, there will always be someone better than you. Okay? It's, it's a never-ending cycle. And uh, if we're not careful, you're not going to escape from the, the grips of envy. And so we need to be careful of uh, even entitlement. Uh, entitlement kind of stems from envy as well. And, and one more thing, because... Envy is very prevalent within ministry. Uh, You're envious of other churches, other ministry, or people's positions, etc. Uh, Because of envy in a person's life, you you might have individuals who do whatever they can to be noticed, to be liked, to be in the spotlight, or to get or have a ministry position. So they'll try to do what they can. They strive. They self-appoint themselves. They push their own agendas. And in the end, it comes to nothing because it wasn't from the Lord or the Lord's timing uh, or because of character issues. Uh, There's a whole range of things there. But uh, envy is very dangerous. Attitude that will affect your countenance and your attitudes toward others. So be very careful of envy. I, I... I want to always check my envy because uh, when I first started out in the ministry, I was jealous of other churches. I was jealous and envious of other pastors. How God's using them in a powerful way and why can't God use me? And so I became envious and so God had to deal with my, my envy and my attitude. Envious people tend to feel hostile 
uh, resentful, angry, and irritable. Uh, envy also uh, can be related to depression, anxiety, and a development of prejudice and personal unhappiness. Anyway, you get the idea of what envy is like, right? One of the ways to kind of get rid of it that I found is you pray for them. Pray for those other people that you're envious of or jealous of. Lord, bless them. Lord, use them. Minister to them. And then you start to feel that poison of envy uh, uh, eliminating from, from your life. And so as you see here again, God's saying, rip off the envy from your life. The, the next word is slander or evil speech, uh, as we see. Slander, as you know, makes a false accusation. It means destroying another person's good reputation by lies or, or half-truths, for that matter, as well. Uh, gossip, rumor spreading, etc., Malice often manifests itself through slander. Slander is speaking against another brother or sister, defaming them. Backbiting of any kind would tear down another person's character. You know, that needs to stop. It needs to be put to death, if you will. Slander is just plain nastiness, right? Nastiness is not a fruit of the Spirit, neither is criticism. Uh, participating in it, listening to it, accepting that nastiness is just as bad, if not worse, than the person, you know, slandering, you know, and gossiping. Uh, so we need to be very careful there uh, and, and be slow to criticize others. Uh, we need to take the plank out of our own or the beam out of our own eyes, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7. So we shouldn't be treating fellow Christians the way the world treats us. And it's been said, as you know, whoever gossips to you will gossip about you. So Peter warns us that our conversation should not slip into slander. Real friends don't broadcast each other's weakness. Real friends, do not, they strive to build each other up in love. When it comes to gossip, don't pass it on. Stop it. Okay? There's too much gossip and slander going on in the body of Christ. Now, if we want to tell others about Jesus, and we have a reputation of being a hypocrite or a slanderer, who's going to take us seriously, right? Why would anyone want to be like us if we act this way? So this is why we need to change our behavior quickly. Remember, people judging our behavior as much as our words. Your actions speak louder than words sometimes. And so this is about our maturity. Uh, the world, as you know, expects you to get revenge. You know, ego says, I got hurt. They said something about me. I want to hurt them right back, right? In other words, vengeance is mine, says my ego, right? And if we learn to take that pain, that hurt, or whatever that situation is, and give it to the Lord, it changes our attitude, if we can see people as those who need the Lord, they need the grace. Maybe there's something going on in their life that the Lord needs to minister to. It changes our desire for revenge or to get even with them. So we need to be careful there. And so when you see people who are miserable and, and want to harm others, uh, it's usually due to some other internal pain of their own that hasn't been dealt with. Okay? And so we need to be careful there. Again, Lord, whatever's going on in that person's life, that you would heal them, that you would deliver them, you would m do what you need to do in their life. Set them free. Now, if you examine most of church splits and divisions or conflict or problems, it boils down to the list of these sins that was just mentioned here. Every single time you see that happening in a church split division or sowing seeds of discord, you can say anything of these five lists within that conversation. And if there's, um, again, there, there's a lot of things that we could unpack and how to respond to hurts and deal with it. Uh, but right now, again, we just need to deal with uh, and evaluate our st uh, current state of health. This is what we need to get rid of. If some of these things have triggered something that God needs to speak to you. He needs to minister to you. He needs to set you free on that. You know, how we got our wound or hurt or whatever happened to us is all unique. 
Uh, and again, I, I can never recount all the possible reasons why we go through what we've gone through or the hurt that we all have, uh, but there are some common themes that uh, we'll, we'll talk about at another time. Uh, but my intention in sharing p perhaps the possible ways that we've been hurt and gone through some of this stuff and uh, buried some memories and pain from what has happened is so we can see what has settled into our hearts. Okay, so this is something that God needs to deal with. We need to confess and get it right with the Lord. So uh, with an open heart to the Holy Spirit to shine His light in the infected areas, achy parts of our soul, we then can begin to deal with some of these things. There's a prayer that I prayed and, uh, for a season that really helped me recover. And it wasn't trying to, re, you know, do the uh, wrote prayer and this is the way I have to pray, but this helped me, this has kind of helped me articulate the hurt and the pain that I was going through. And, um, you know, and this is something that maybe uh, you would probably be saying amen to. Lord, right now I'm really angry with this person for what they did to me or said to me. It's wrong, I'm hurt, it's not fair. First of all, I pray for that person or group of people. I lift them up to you as you teach us to, to, to pray for our enemies, to love our enemies. And, and I'm doing that right now. And I take that pain. I lay it at the foot of the cross. You said to forgive others. And I'm asking that right now. The anger is blocking my peace from you. And therefore the situation is your problem. So I can now once again draw close to you. I pray for humility and healing in Jesus' name. And there's many other prayers like that, but that kind of helped me get through the pain and the difficulty when I went through uh, some stuff. So these five sins that are listed in verse 1 are defiling. They are uh, blunt to our taste to the Word of God. So if you're uh, doing these sort of things, you're not going to be hungry for the Word. It inhabits our, hap uh, our appetite for spiritual things. So as it continues on in verse 2, dealing with the Word of God, as newborn beings desire to crave uh, the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. So as newborn babes uh, crave milk, so do born-again believers crave. They long for the spiritual milk of the Word. You're hungry for it. You want to know more. And I pray that doesn't just stop when you first come to the Lord, but you're still hungry. You're still thirsting for it. You'll never, you know... Get the depths of all that the Word has for us. It's fresh, it's living, it's powerful. The Word of God is described living and enduring. And like milk, it is essential nourishment for babes. It sustains life and gives growth. And uh, as the psalmist describes the God's Word in Psalm chapter two, uh, Psalm 2, 12, uh, verse 6, says that the words of the Lord are pure, tried like so, uh, furnace of the earth, purified seven times. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, as it says in Psalm, uh, one, uh, Psalm 19. And over and over you see just different examples of the purity of God's word, uh, how it brings health and healing. Uh, just by hearing the word of God, your faith grows. So the purity of God's word means that there is no imperfection, no flaws, and it will not be deceived or lead people astray. That's why it's so important to, to be Berean. Study the Word of God. Test it out. Don't, as we said many times, never trust a man behind a pulpit without a Bible in your hands. Now, can I also say one thing just as it came to mind? Can I encourage you? It's good to have a, a Bible on your phone or iPad, but there may come a day that technology will fail. So can I encourage you? Get this. Okay? Write up, highlight it. I try to go through a... a, a, a you know, a Bible a year, a highlight, underline, this is just my preaching Bible. Uh, I bring it up in here because it's easier to see. Uh, I did get glasses, I just don't like wearing them. Um, but can I encourage you, get the Word, so you know it, you know, so you can write on it, because our apps may fail. The computers may fail at some point. I'm not saying put fear in you, I'm just saying this, get your Word out. Test it, know it. Anyways, the Word of God, we need to be craving it. And uh, thirsting for it. And that means we are to depend upon, like a, a, a baby depends upon milk. And so with that, again, verse 2 with verse 1. Again, verse 1 is about the things that life we're to get rid of, to be better Christians and better witnesses, immediately followed by the request to be do, uh, diligent students of the Word. So the two go hand in hand. Give those bad thoughts to the Lord, replace it with the Word of God. 
The two go hand in hand, you see. So if you, you know, given those bad thoughts to God, in a sense, you, you, you start to fill that hole in your head with the Word of God. It renews our mind. You feel refreshed afterwards, encouraged. And I believe Peter wants us to fill the negative void uh, with Scripture. Uh, and, and if we expect to turn over our pain to the Lord, we need to replace the negative thoughts and attitudes and issues with something positive and pleasing, and that's the Word of God. And so it seems that Peter's arguing that in order to grow in maturity, it requires a regular reading of God's Word, feeding on it. Whatever works for you. If it's a verse a day, I'm sure you can do more than a verse a day, but get into the Word. And, and let it just minister to you. Don't, don't say, I'm trying to just crank through 15 chapters a day, you know. But what did you read? Just meditate on it. Think about it. Read it out loud. Uh, one of the things I like about the YouVersion uh, app is that it can read it back to you, you know. What I also do is I take the text, I put it in my notes on my uh, um, iPad or my phone, and I hit speak screen. And it reads my screen back to me. So I can listen to the Word of God that way if none of my other apps are working. Anyways. But we can't reap spiritual dividends if we don't invest in the Word. Amen? Last verse, verse 3. If indeed have tasted the Lord is good or gracious. So this ties back to the craving of the milk. A baby takes a taste of milk and instinctively says, Hey, this is good stuff. You know, I like some more, please. You know? And uh, the same should be our attitude. So Peter is preaching on maturity of the believer. And part of the maturity comes from a regular studying of God's Word. And this is why here at Calvary we teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so you get the whole counsel of God's Word. My opinion doesn't matter. What I say doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the Word of God. Okay? That's the most important part of this message is the reading of God's Word. Okay? And so... To grow up in your salvation implies that once you're saved, there's more to it. That's just the beginning. There's a maturity process. And so Peter picked a beautiful invitation as Psalm 34, verse 8 tells us, and placed in the past tense for those believers, taste and see that the Lord is good. And over and over you'll see that phrase throughout Scripture. The believers had already taken the first step in following the Lord and accepting salvation... And at that time, they had tasted. And you've tasted as well. Oh, so good to be refreshed. So good to have my sins forgiven. And so they personally experienced God's goodness and His kindness and His grace and His love. And as they lived out their Christian lives, growing toward maturity and faith, they were tasting more and more of God's goodness. And I pray that you would take all oh, the Lord is good. He is so gracious. He, the way He's provided, the way He's protected, you know, Many of us in some situations, you know. And, and so that should just serve to whet our appetites. The more we taste the goodness of God, the more tasteless other worldly op options become. And that could be your prayer for one another. Oh, that they would taste the, uh, the goodness of the Lord. That they would thirst after the Lord. You know, so may we not fill our lives with cheap substitutes so we lose our craving for the truth contained in the Word of God. Make that your master passion, you know, and just, Lord, give me that hunger for your Word. Even praying that, you'll start to have a hunger for His Word and wanting to spend time with Him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your grace and mercy. We thank You that You are in control. We thank You that You are sovereign. I pray that each and every one of us would have a deeper hunger and thirst for your word, for righteousness and holiness, and a hatred for evil. That you would replace those things of the world, the things of our flesh, with the things that please you. And so I pray for the filling and overflowing of your spirit in every believer's life here today. That you would speak, that you would minister, that you would heal, that you would set free. Whatever's going on in a person's heart and mind, that you would minister to them. The struggles that we may have, the fear, the worries, the anxiety, uh, whatever's going to happen in our future, we just surrender it to you. We thank you for this day that we can worship you, draw close to you. And we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity uh, to baptize uh, believers as they publicly declare their faith in you. 
And so we thank you. We worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.